Hello, listeners. If you've enjoyed these narrations, please click on that like and subscribe button. I finished reading the first chapter of the book, Soul Collecting 101. It took me the better half of the day, and even then I had to read it a couple more times to fully grasp what it was saying, what it was explaining. Everything sounded just so crazy. Every 20th person has made a deal with the devil. I didn't even know the devil was real. I mean, why would I think he is? Or is it a she? And every 20th person? Does that mean every 20th person is running around with no soul, filthy rich, hot as hell, or whatever they wished for? Souls aren't worth as much as you think. An average human soul doesn't even interest the devil and he won't buy it for an outrageous wish. So every 20th person is maybe just a little richer, maybe just a little handsomer. But where does my grandfather come into play here? What was he doing? As famously known, people often attempt to trick the devil into giving them their wish, while still being able to keep their soul. And sometimes the sold soul never makes it into the devil's hands. That's where Soul Collecting 101 comes into play. Devils do not wish to waste their time to collect lowly souls themselves. So, they employ me, or you, to collect it for them. I wonder if my soul would be considered lowly. Would I get a good wish for it? But that's not the point right now. Since it doesn't say, I'll just assume they pay in lowly human currency for these jobs. How would I go about collecting a soul anyway? Soul collecting is simple on paper. You have to make them willingly submit their soul and then place it into a soul jar which the devil provides. That sounds anything but simple. Making them willingly submit their soul? Who in their right mind would just give up their soul? How am I supposed to do that? Just walk up to somebody? Hey, you owe your soul to the devil. Do you mind paying up? I put the book back on the coffee table, lying back. What to do, what to do. Maybe I should call Ezekiel. None of this makes any logical sense. Mm, nah, he'll think I'm actually interested in this then. I'm just testing the waters. All I really want is the cabin in the woods to sell. Hi. I suddenly hear a demonic voice say from somewhere in my apartment. I scream in horror, getting up frantically and looking around. I see a young boy, Louis, standing in the doorway to my kitchen, still wearing his overalls, waving his hand at me. You scared me, dude. I shouted at him. He sheepishly grinned in response. Oh, I love doing that. He whispered under his breath which I can still hear. What was that? Nothing. What do you want? How's it going? Reading the rule book, I mean. I slumped back into my cushioned chair, picking it back up. I've barely gone through the first three or four pages and already have a massive headache trying to understand it all. It's like trying to study a combination of medicine and law while being high on LSD. Not good. Lewis takes my silence for an answer. I nod to him. Well, how about a little practical experience on soul collecting? He said, his demonic soul sounding excited. That voice gives me chills, but I perk up my ears to listen anyway. I have this guy, sold his soul to me a while ago, and as per our contract, I was to collect it on New Year's. Well, it's been two weeks since New Year's, and I still haven't heard a peep from him. I had so many questions running through my head. Lewis was the devil? What did the man wish for? Where was he now? Why do devils collect the souls of living anyway? Instead of asking any of that, I just gulped down on my saliva and thought about my question very carefully. What do I get out of this? 
Yeah, yeah. I'll pay you. No biggie. The devil is more like a young hippie. I saw his lips perk up into a grin. Why are you smiling? You do know that I can read your thoughts. I flushed in embarrassment and horror. Get out of my head. Yeah, yeah. He dismissed me like it was nothing. I can't answer all of your questions. But since he's already broken the contract, I can reveal the contents of his wish. I waited in anticipation. This could determine whether I'd do the job or not. He wished for his crimes to be forgotten by all living beings. What was his crimes? If he was a murderer, I don't think I'll do this, but if he's just a thief, then just maybe I'd go through with it. I do not know. Lewis responded, sound a little disappointed himself. What were all these people back in my grandfather's funeral? Were they also devils? I asked. No. I was the only devil present. I do not know all of those people. But I assume all of them were business partners in one way or another. Well, what about Ezekiel? I would stay away from Ezekiel. Lewis said grimly. I nodded along. Well, how about some experience in soul collecting? Lewis tried using an uplifting tone, which just made his demonic voice sound really weird. Can't you do something about your voice? Maybe make it sound a little more human? I asked carefully, trying not to offend. Lewis flashed hurt on his face. This is my true voice. Why would I want to change it? I sighed in defeat. Alright, alright, sorry I asked. He walked over to my TV. Fun fact, these things are often used as portals. He put his small hand on the screen, rubbing a spot in circles. The TV suddenly lit up and a channel opened. I could hear people screaming coming from the other end. What is that? I asked curiously. Hell. Lewis smiled at me and removed his hand, the TV turning back off again. So, how about it you want this job or not? I don't have all day. I knew I couldn't avoid his question for the fourth time. Only if you can give me a search area, or even better, his direct location. Lewis grinned at me then, and walked up to me reaching out his little hand. I looked at it curiously. I can do one better. I took his hand and he pulled me in. This might hurt. He warned. Wait, wait, wait. I tried to say, but it was already too late. My clothes had already caught on fire and I could feel the heat on my skin. I tried flailing around. I tried putting out the flames, but it was no use. It traveled upwards until it reached my torso, but then my neck, and soon my entire body was burning. The flames were incredibly hot. The heat was intense, and I could feel it licking my skin. But strangely enough, I thought it would hurt more. The flames suddenly started going out slowly, and the intense heat disappeared. I opened my eyes again, and the first thing I did was check myself. I was completely unharmed. My clothes, too, were unburnt. How was this possible? My entire body was literally just on fire. Was that fun? Lewis asked with a smug expression. I gave him a look. Warn me next time, all right? I said, feigning hurt. Truth was, this was actually kind of cool. I did warn you. Lewis responded defensively. Had he been a normal boy, I bet we could have been the best of friends. Or 
maybe not friends, uncle and nephew? I am probably 300 times older than you. Stop reading my mind. All right, all right. He put his hands up defensively. Where did you take us? I started asking the important questions. To the center. I took this time to look around. I could tell that we were in the dark, small room, but nothing else besides that. Lewis snapped his fingers and a small flame appeared in his hand, illuminating the room, which I now realized was a closet big enough for people to walk around in. I noticed a light bulb on the ceiling with a string attached to it. I pulled on it and the light came on. I looked around for the door, and once I found it I attempted to open it carefully and quietly. It opened into the outside, so I had to use a little force to push it open, which then resulted in the door banging against the wall and the man's whose home we were in to be alerted of it. What was that? I heard a male voice say from somewhere else. Lewis shook his head at me. I stepped out of the closet, not sure what to do next. I looked around for a weapon and found a table lamp which I quickly snatched up. The footsteps were getting closer. I hid behind the door. Lewis was just standing out in the open. What are you doing? I angrily whispered at him. You can't see me. Lewis said normally and then added, Oh, but he does have a large knife. He grinned. I flipped him off with my middle finger. I saw the man's toes just barely past the door frame, but he stopped moving. And suddenly he jumped into the room facing the open closet door. Luckily he didn't see me, because I was hidden behind the door. I heard the man sigh in relief, and he walked up to the door and closed it. I was now out in the open. I quickly lifted the table lamp up and smashed it on his head. He fell over and was knocked unconscious. Lewis clapped his hands. Here's your soul, now take me home. He shook his head in response. You have to make him give it up, remember? I suddenly remembered reading about it, and I could slap myself across the face. Just make sure he doesn't wake up then. After telling Lewis, I walked through the apartment, searching for three simple things. A chair, rope, and duct tape. This man was living quite a rich life, making me believe the theory even more that the man was a robber. With the chair and duct tape in hand, I returned to Lewis. The man was still unconscious on the ground. I lifted him up and sat him down in the chair and began tying him up using the tape. Unfortunately, no rope could be found. Not like anybody just keeps rope around their house, though. After about a good ten minutes, I finally felt confident enough that he wouldn't be able to break free. The man didn't look strong. He looked kind of skinny anyway. He had almost no muscles and was pretty short. The entire time, Lewis was just observing me and my actions, like a teacher observing a student. Well, I looked at him. Oh, right, the soul jar. Lewis sprung into action, snapping his fingers once. Flames burst out from his feet before slowly succumbing into thin air. In the place stood a glass jar. By the way, if you fail to make him give up his soul, then you'll pay with yours instead. He said, giving me a sly smile. This devil, he tricked me. It was time for this guy to wake up. I slapped him across the face. He didn't budge. I walked to the kitchen and filled up a large cup with water. Once I got back, I poured it over his head. This time he jolted awake. Please, don't hurt me. He pleaded, trying to move his bound state. That depends. I was trying to sound as cunning as possible. You signed your soul off to the devil. I've come to collect, I said in my deepest possible voice, and I was standing in a darker corner of the room so he couldn't be able to see me. Please, 
Anything, just let me live. She pleaded again. I looked at Lewis for guidance. Does this already count as giving up his soul? He just shrugged. I opened the jar and spoke. Say that you will give me your soul willingly. I I'm giving my soul to this person. The man said quickly. He doesn't mean it. He has to mean it. Lewis said behind me. You have to mean it. I repeated Lewis's words to the man. Okay, okay. I am willingly giving my soul away. He said rapidly. I saw a small orb appear from his chest. It hovered above the man. Again, I said. I give my soul away. Take it, please. I was a little confused on why this man was so terrified of me. I mean, if he just said no... I'd be the one giving my soul to the devil instead. The orb slowly started to move towards me. I held up the jar and it floated inside. I closed it. Are you happy? I said out loud. Lewis nodded and clapped his hands. Oh, oh no, it's, it's you. The man was looking at Lewis wide-eyed. You can see him? I have ownership of his soul now. So naturally he can see me, Lewis said, sounding uninterested. I, I never signed my soul to you, or only some of my memories, he accused Lewis. Well, I wanted your soul as well. What's going on? I looked at Lewis, my eyes pleading for an answer. He didn't owe me a soul, but you just made him give it up. So, thank you for that. He smiled. I was frozen in place. He tricked me twice. Untie the man. We're leaving. I nodded and cut the tape with scissors. Please, give it back. The man pleaded. I could only look at him with sorrow, regretful eyes. Lewis snapped his fingers and my clothes caught on fire again. Soon, I was back in my apartment, standing in the exact same spot as before we left. You tricked me, I said under my breath. Yeah, well, that's also a valuable lesson. And this devil, demon, whatever you want to call him, I let my guard down because he seemed innocent. He seemed nice. He looked like a kid with a scary voice. Well, I'll be on my way. I hope this practical experience will help you in your future endeavors of collecting souls. He said nonchalantly. He had a strange look in his eyes. I couldn't tell whether it was regret or triumph. He bursted into flames and disappeared into thin air. I just sighed and leaned back into my chair once more. Looking at the time, it was getting late now, so I decided to head back to bed. Today, I learned not to trust the devil, no matter how nice or innocent he may look.